Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today to begin reading Journey to the River Sea by Eva Abotson. This book is published by Puffin Books, and we're gonna get started right away with chapter one. It was a good school, one of the best in London. Miss Banks and her sister Emily believed that girls should be taught as thoroughly and as carefully as boys. They had bought three houses in a quiet square, a pleasant place with plain trees and well-behaved pigeons, and put up a brass plate saying the Mayfair Academy for Young Ladies, and they had prospered. For a while, the sisters prized proper learning. For a while, the sisters prized proper learning, they also prized good manners, thoughtfulness, and care for others, and the girls learned both algebra and needlepoint. Moreover, they took in children whose parents were abroad and needed somewhere to spend the holidays. Now, some 30 years later, in the autumn of 1910, the school had a waiting list, and those girls who went there knew how lucky they were. At the same, all the same, there were times that were very boring. Miss Carlyle was giving a geography lesson in the big classroom which faced the street. She was a good teacher, but even the best teachers have trouble making the rivers of Southern England seem unusual and exciting. Now, can anyone tell me the exact source of the River Thames, she asked. She passed her eyes along the rows of desks, missed the plump Hermione, the worried looking Daisy, and stopped by the girl in the front row. Don't chew the end of your pigtail, she was about to say, but she did not say it for it was a day when this particular girl had a right to chew the curved end of her single heavy braid. Maya had seen the motor stop outside the door, had seen old Mr. Murray in his velvet collared coat go to the house. Mr. Murray was Maya's guardian, and today, as everyone knew, he was bringing news about her future. Maya raised her eyes to Miss Carlyle and struggled to concentrate. In the room full of fair and light brown heads, she stood out with her pale triangular face, her widely spaced dark eyes. Her ears lay bare, lay, laid bare by the heavy rope of black hair gave her an unprotected look. The Thames rises in the Cotswold Hills, she began in her low clear voice, and a small hamlet, only what small hamlet? She had no idea. The door opened and 20 heads turned. Would Maya Fielding come to Miss Bank's room, please? Said the maid. Maya rose to her feet. Fear is the cause of all evil, she told herself, but she was afraid. Afraid of the future, afraid of the unknown, afraid in the way of someone who is alone in the world. Miss Banks was sitting behind her desk. Her sister, Miss Emily, stood beside her. Mr. Murray was in a leather chair by the table, rustling papers. Mr. Murray was Maya's guardian, but he was also a lawyer and never forgot it. Things had to be done carefully and slowly and written down. Maya looked round at the assembled faces. They looked cheerful, but that could mean anything, and she bent down to pat Miss Banks' spaniel, finding comfort in the feel of his round, warm head. Well, Maya, we have some good news, said Miss Banks, a woman now in her 60s, frightening to many and with an amazing bust, which would have done splendidly on the prow of a sailing ship. She smiled at the girl standing in front of her, a clever child and a brave one, who had fought hard to overcome the devastating blow of her parents' death in a train crash in Egypt two years earlier. The staff knew how Maya had wept night after night under her pillow, trying not to wake her friends. If good fortune was to come her way, there was no one who deserved it more. We have found your relatives, Miss Banks went on. And will they? Maya began, but she could not finish. Miss Mur Mr. Murray now took over. They are willing to give you a home. Maya took a deep breath. A home. She had spent her holidays for the past two years at the school. Everyone was friendly and kind, but a home. Not only that, said Miss Emily, but it turns out that the Carters have twin daughters about your age. She smiled broadly and nodded as though she herself had arranged the birth of the twins for Maya's benefit. Mr. Murray patted a large folder on his knee. As you know, we have been searching for a long time for anyone related to your late father. We knew there was a second cousin, a Mr. Clifford Carter, but all efforts to trace him failed until two months ago when we heard that he had emigrated six years earlier. He had left England with his family. So where is he now, Maya asked. There was a moment of silence. 
It was as though the good news had now run out and Mr. Murray looked solemn and cleared his throat. <clears throat> He's living, the Carters are living on the Amazon in South America, in Brazil, put in Miss Banks. Maya lifted her head. On the Amazon, she said. In the jungle, do you mean? Not exactly. Mr. Carter is a rubber planter. He has a house on the river not far from the city of Manus. It's a perfectly civilized place. I have, of course, arranged for the consul out there to visit. He knows the family and they are very respectable. There is a pause. I thought you would wish me to make a regular payment to the Carters for your keep and your schooling. As you know, your father left you well provided for. Yes, of course, I would like that. I would like to pay my share. But Maya was not thinking of her money. She was thinking of the Amazon, of rivers full of leeches, of dark forests with hostile native people and blowpipes and nameless insects which burrowed into the flesh. How could she live there? And to give herself courage, she said, what are they called? Who? The old man was still wondering about the arrangements he had made with Mr. Carter. Had he had offered too much for Miss Maya's keep? The twins, what are the name of the twins? Beatrice and Gwendolyn, said Miss Emily. They have written you a note. Then she handed Maya a single sheet of paper. Dear Maya, the girls had written, we hope you will come and live with us. We think it would be nice. Maya saw them as she read, fair and curly-haired and pretty, everything she longed to be and wasn't. If they could live in the jungle, so, she could, so could she. When do I go, she asked. At the end of next month. It has all worked out very well because the Carters have engaged a new governess and she will travel out with you. A governess? In the jungle? How strange it all sounded. But the letter from the girls had given her heart. They were looking forward to having her. They wanted her. Surely it would be all right. Well, let's hope it's for the best, said Miss Banks after Maya left the room. They were more serious now. It was a long way to send a child to an unknown family. And there was Maya's music to consider. She played the piano well, but what interested the staff was Maya's voice. Her mother had been a singer. Maya's own voice was sweet and true. Though she did not want to sing professionally, her eagerness to learn new songs and understand them was exceptional. And what was that to send, to set against the chance of a loving home? The Carters had seemed really pleased to take Maya, and she was an attractive child. The consul has promised to keep me informed, said Mr. Murray, and the meeting broke up. Meanwhile, Maya's return to the classroom meant the end of the tributaries of the Thames. Tomorrow we'll have our lesson on the Amazon and the rivers of South America, said Miss Carlyle. I want all of you to find at least one interesting fact about it. She smiled at Maya, and I shall expect you to tell us how you will travel and for how long so that we can share your adventure. There was no doubt about it. Maya was a heroine, but not the kind that people envy, more the kind that people got, uh, the kind that got burnt at the stake. By the time her friends had clustered around her with oohs and ahs and cries of distress, Maya wanted nothing except to run away and hide. But she didn't. She asked permission to go to the library after supper. The library at the academy was a good one. That night, Maya sat alone on top of the mahogany library steps, and she read, and she read, and she read. There's a picture of her sitting on the steps and reading. She read about the great broad-leaved trees of the rainforest pierced by sudden rays of sun. She read about the travelers who had explored the maze of rivers and found a thousand plants and animals that had never been seen before. She read about brilliantly colored birds flashing between the laden branches, macaws and hummingbirds and parakeets, and butterflies the, sizes, the size of saucers, and curtains of sweetly scented orchards trailing from the trees. She read about the wisdom of the local people who would cure sickness and wounds that no one in Europe understood. Those who think of the Amazon as a green hell, she read in an old book with a tattered spine, bring only their own fears and prejudices to this amazing land. For whether a place is a hell or a heaven, rest in yourself, and those who go with courage and an open mind may find themselves in paradise. Maya looked up from the book. I can do it, she vowed. I can make it a heaven, and I will. Matron found her there long after bedtime, still perched on the ladder, but she did not scold her, for there was a strange look on the girl's face, as though she were already in another country. 
everyone came well prepared to the geography lesson on the following day. You start, Hermione, said Miss Carlyle. What did you find about the Amazon? Hermione looked anxiously at Maya. There are huge crocodiles in the rivers that can snap your head off in one bite. Only they're not called crocodiles, they're called alligators, because their snouts are fatter, but they're just as fierce. And if you put just one hand in the water, there are these piranhas that strip all the flesh off your bones, every single bit. They look just like ordinary fish, but their teeth are terrible, said Melanie. Daisy offered a mosquito which bit you and gave you yellow fever. And you turn as yellow as a lemon, and then you die, she said. And it's so hot, the sweat absolutely runs off you in buckets. Not sweat, dear. Perspiration, corrected Miss Carlyle. Anna described the native people covered in terrifying swirls of paint who shot you with poisoned arrows which paralyzed you and made you mad. From rows came jaguars, silent as shadows, which pounced on anyone who dared go in the forest. Miss Carlyle now raised a hand and looked worriedly at Maya. The girl was pale and silent, and the teacher was very sorry now that she had told the class to find out what they could. And you, Maya, what did you find out? Maya rose to her feet. She had written notes, but she did not look at them, and when she began to speak, she held her head high, for her time in the library had changed everything. The Amazon is the largest river in the world. The Nile is a bit longer, but the Amazon has the most water. It used to be called the River Sea because of that, and all over Brazil there are rivers that run into it. Some of the rivers are black and some are brown, and the ones that run from the south are blue, and this is because what is under the water. When I go, I shall travel on a boat of the Booth Line, and it will take four weeks to go across the Atlantic. And then I will get to Brazil, where I will still have to travel a thousand miles along the river, between trees that lean over the water, and there will be scarlet birds and sandbanks, and creatures like big guinea pigs called capa capybaras, which you can tame. After another two weeks on the boat, I shall reach the city of Manus which is a beautiful place with a theater and the, with a green and gold roof and shops and hotels just like here because the people who grew rubber out there became very rich. They could build such a place even in the middle of the jungle. And that is where I should be met by Mr. and Mrs. Carter and by Beatrice and Gwendolyn. She broke off and grinned at her classmates. And after that, I don't know, but it's going to be all right. But she needed all of her courage as she stood in the hall a month later, saying goodbye. Her trunk was corded. Her traveling cape lay on the small suitcase, which was all she was allowed to take into her cabin on the ship. And she stood in a circle of her friends. Hermione was crying. The youngest pupil, Dora, was clutching her skirt. Don't go, Maya, she wailed. I don't want you to go. Who's going to tell me stories? Who will miss you, shrieked Melanie. Don't step on a boa constructor. Write, oh please write lots of letters. Last minute presents had been stuffed into her case. A slightly strange pin cushion made by Anna, a set of ribbons for her hair. The teachers too had come to see her off and the maids were coming upstairs. You'll be all right, miss, they said. You'll have a lovely time. But they looked at her with pity. Piranhas and alligators were in the air and the housemaids who had sat up most of the night with Maya after she had heard of her parents' death uh, was wiping her eyes on the corner of her apron. The headmistress now came down the stairs, followed by Miss Emily, and everyone made way for her as she walked up to Maya. But the farewell speech that Miss Bank had prepared was never made, and said she came forward and put her arms around Maya, who vanished for the last time into the folds of her tremendous bosom. Farewell, my child, she said, and God bless you. And then the porter came and said that the carriage was at the door. The girls followed Maya out into the street, but at the sight of the black-clad woman sitting stiffly in the back of the cab, her hands on her umbrellas, Maya, her umbrella, Maya faltered. This was Miss Minton, the governess, who was going to take her on the journey. Doesn't she look fierce, whispered Melanie. Poor you, mumbled Hermione. And indeed, the tall, gaunt woman looked more like a rake or a nutcracker than a human being. Here's a picture of Miss Minion. The door of the cab opened. A hand in a black glove, bony and cold as a skeleton, was stretched out to help her in. Maya took it, and followed by the shrieks of her schoolmates, they set off. For the first part of the journey, Maya kept her eyes on the side of the road. Now that she was really leaving her friends, it was hard to hold back her tears. 
She had reached the gulping stage when she heard a loud snapping noise and turned her head. Miss Minton had opened the metal clasp of a large black handbag and was handing her a clean handkerchief embroidered with an A. Myself, the governess said in her deep, gruff voice, I was thinking how lucky I was, how fortunate. I would think how lucky I was, how fortunate. To go to the Amazon, you mean? To have so many friends who were sad to see me go. Didn't you have friends who minded you leaving? Miss Minton's thin lips twitched for a moment. My sister's canary, perhaps, if he had understood what was happening, which was extremely doubtful. Maya turned her head. Miss Minchin was certainly a most extraordinary-looking person. Her eyes, behind thick, dark-rimmed spectacles, were the color of mud. Her mouth was narrow, her nose thin and sharp, and her black felt hat was tethered to her sparse bun of hair with a fearsome hat pin in the shape of a Viking spear. It's copied from the armor of Eric the Hammerer, said Miss Minton, following Maya's gaze. One can kill with a hat pin like this. Both of them fell silent again, till the cab lurched suddenly, and Miss Minton's umbrella clattered to the floor. It was quite the lar it was quite the largest and ugliest umbrella Maya had ever seen, with a steel spike and a long shaft ending in a handle shaped like the beak of a bird of prey. Miss Minton, however, was looking carefully at a crack in the handle which had been mended with a bit of glue. Did you break it before? Maya asked politely. Yes. She peered at the hideous umbrella through her thick glasses. I broke it on the back of a boy called Henry Hartington. Maya shrank back. H how? She began, but her mouth had gone dry. I threw them on the ground, and I knelt on him and billabored him with my umbrella, Miss Minton said, hard for a long time. She leaned back in her seat, looking almost happy. Maya swallowed. What had he done? He had tried to smuff stuff a small spaniel puppy through the wire mesh of his father's tennis court. Oh, was it badly hurt, the puppy? Yes. What happened to it? One leg was dislocated and its eye was scratched. The gardener managed to set the leg, but we couldn't do anything about his eye. How did Henry's mother punish him? She didn't. Oh, dear me, no. I was dismissed and said, without a reference. Miss Minton, Miss Minton turned away. The year that followed, when she could not get another job and had to stay with her married sister, was one that she was not willing to remember or discuss. The cab stopped. They had reached Euston Station. Miss Minden waved her umbrella at the porter, and Maya's trunk and her suitcase were lifted onto a trolley. Then came a battered tin trunk with the letters A. Minton painted on the side. You'll need two men for that, said the governess. But when he came to lift the trunk, he staggered. Crikey, ma'am, what have you got in there? he asked. Miss Minton looked at him haughtily and did not answer. Then she led Maya to the platform where the train waited to take them to Liverpool and the RMS Cardinal bound for Brazil. They were steaming out of the station before Maya asked, Was it books in the trunk? It was books, admitted Miss Minton. And Maya said, Good. Chapter 2 The Cardinal was a beautiful ship, a snow-white liner with slender, light blue funnels. She had two salons, a dining room, and lots of deck space, where people could lie about and drink beef tea or play games. Isn't it lovely, said Maya, and she imagined herself standing by the railing with the wind in her face as she watched the purposes play on the wild white birds wheel and circle overhead. But the beginning of the voyage wasn't at all like that, because after the ship left Lisbon, the cardinal ran into a storm. Great green waves loomed up like mountains. The ship rolled and shuddered and pitched. Hardly anyone got as far as the dining room, and the doors to the decks were closed so that any passengers still on their legs did not get washed overboard. Maya and Miss Minton shared a cabin with two Portuguese ladies who spent their time in their bunks, groaning and being sick, praying to the Virgin Mary and begging to die. Maya thought this was going too far, but it is true that being seasick is so awful that people suit do sometimes wish that the ship would simply sink and put them out of their misery. Maya was not seasick, and nor was Miss Minton. They did not exactly feel hungry, but they managed to get to the dining room, holding on to everything they could find, and to eat some of the soup that the waiters poured into the plates fastened on the table with a special gadget that was brought out in storms. It was difficult not to feel superior when everyone is ill, and you aren't, and Maya couldn't help being a bit pleased with herself. 
This lasted until Miss Mitten, hanging on the saloon rail with her long black arms, said that this would be a good time to start learning Portuguese. We shall be undisturbed. Maya thought it was a bad idea. Maybe the twins would teach me. They must speak it if they've been there so long. You don't want to arrive in a country unable to make yourself understood. Everyone speaks Portuguese in Brazil. Even the natives mix it with their own language. But the lessons did not go well. Miss Minton had found a book about the family of Senhor and Senhora Olivares and their children Pedro and Silva Silvania, who did the things that people do in phrase books, like losing their luggage and finding a fly in their soup. But fixing their eyes on a page when the boat was heaving made Miss Minton and Maya feel definitely queasy. Trying to read when you are being tossed about is not a good idea. Then, on the second day of the storm, Maya made her way to the main salon, where the passengers were supposed to sit and enjoy their drinks and have parties. Miss Vinton was helping the Portuguese ladies, and Maya wanted to get out of the way. It was a huge room with red plush sofas screwed into the floor and long gilt-edged mirrors lining the walls, and at first she thought it was empty. Then she saw a boy about her own age peering into one of the mirrors on the far wall. He had fair hair, long and curly, and was dressed in old-fashioned clothes, velvet knickerbockers, and a belted jacket too short in the sleeves. And when he turned around, she saw that he was looking unhappy and afraid. Are you feeling sick, she asked him. No, but I'm getting a spot, he said, pointing to the red pimple on his chin. His voice trembled, and to her amazement, she saw that his big blue eyes had filled with tears. It's not chicken pox, Maya said firmly. We just had chicken pox at school and it doesn't look like this. I know it isn't chicken pox. It's a spot because I'm growing up. There's another one starting on my forehead. He lifted his long curls to show Maya, but at that moment the boat tilted violently. She had to wait until the boy was level again to see the small red pimple over his right eye. And the other day my voice suddenly cracked. It went down a whole octave. If it happens on stage, I'm finished. Of course, you came with those actors, didn't you? The pilgrim players said Maya. She remembered now seeing a whole crowd of oddly dressed people getting on at Lisbon, taking, talking at the top of their voices and waving their arms. But surely the spots won't show under your makeup. Well, I can't wear makeup on my voice. If it cracks in Little Lord Fauntleroy, they'll throw me out. They wouldn't do that, Maya said firmly. You're a child. People don't throw children out like that. Oh, don't they, said the boy. He looked at Maya, her neat, expensive clothes, her carefully braided hair. You don't know what it's like. The boat lurched again, throwing the children against each other, and they struggled towards a sofa fastened to the floor. The boy's name was Clovis King. It's not my real name. My real name is Jimmy Bates, but they changed it when they adopted me. Who did? Who adopted you? The Goodleys, Mr. and Mrs. Goodley. They own the acting company, and they play most of the leads. Then there's Mrs. Goodley da Goodley's daughter, Nancy. She's awful, and Mrs. Goodley's sister, and Mr. Goodley's nephew. He's the stage manager, and he does the box office. And old Mrs. Goodley does the costumes, but she can't see too well. They found me when they were on their way to York. I was playing cricket on the village green with my family, and they said that, with my friends, and they said they'd teach me to act and play juvenile leads. You know, all the children's parts, and the page boys, and things like that. Because I had a good voice, and I could sing, and I looked right. Didn't your parents mind? I don't have any parents. I was living with my foster mother. She cried and cried when I went, but the Goodley said it would be a good chance for me. I could make a lot of money and come back rich and famous. But I didn't make any money because no one ever gets paid. And we're always in debt and we just trail about from one awful hot place to another. But isn't it fun, the acting and the traveling? No, it isn't. We stay in beastly hotels full of bed bugs and the food makes me feel sick. My foster mother used to be a cook in a big house. She made toad in the hole and treacle pudding and custard and I had a clean vest every day, said Clovis. And once again, his eyes filled with tears. We haven't been back to England for four years and if they throw me out, I'll never get back there on my own because I haven't any money. Maya did her best to comfort him, but later when she was alone with Miss Minton, could they do that? She asked, could they throw him out? Unlikely, said the governess. It depends on whether they adopted him legally or not. But when the sea became calm again and the passengers came out on deck, they weren't so sure. The Goodleys were not exactly nasty, but they behaved as if no one existed in the world except for them. Mr. Goodley was tall with a red face, white hair, and a loud, braying voice. 
Mrs. Goodley's hair was dyed a fierce red, and she wore layers of scarves and boas and shawls, which cut cotton things. And Nancy Goodley, who was 19, simpered and minced and ordered everyone about. As well as the Goodleys, there was an Italian couple, the Santorinis, who did the music and the dancing, and a very old man whose false teeth were so white than what that one wanted to blink when one looked at him. He's got another set of teeth through any place villains. They're yellow with black holes in them, and they're terrifying, whispered Clovis. The first thing Mr. Goodley did when all the actors had pulled, piled onto the deck was to move away the other passengers who were trying to read or have a game of CODIS. We must be quite undisturbed for at least two hours, he said. And then they started doing their acting exercises. Mr. Goodley had invented those, and he was very proud of them. He had even written a book about them, but no one would publish it. They threw their arms out towards the sea and cried, Mary to the right, while their faces became violently cheerful. And then they threw them in the other direction and cried, Mary to the left. And then they did wretched to the right and wretched to the left and their faces stopped being cheerful and became extremely sad. Clovis had to join in with the others, but whenever he could, he came over to talk to Maya and Miss Minton and asked them questions about England. Do they still play Conkers, he wanted to know, and make a guy on Bonfire Day? What about snowmen? Has there been a lot of snow? Yes, it was good last year, said Maya. We could always run out when the first flakes fall and try to catch them on our tongues. The first snow tastes like nothing else in the world. Clovis agreed, but the thought of tasting things set him off on what he missed most from England, the food. Do you still have semolina bake for puddings, a kind of squelchy raisins in it? And what about jam roly-poly and plum duff with cornflower sauce? Maya said yes, they had all those at school, but she couldn't help feeling sorry for Clovis, so who was so homesick for the stodgy puddings that she had hoped to never eat again. The next day, the company rehearsed Little Roy, Lord Fauntleroy. Maya had read the book. It was soppy, but a good story all the same, and she thought Clovis acted very well. He was the hero, of course, the little American boy who finds that he is heir to a great castle in England owned by his crusty old grandfather, the Earl. The boy's name was Cedric, and he called his mother Dearest, and together they traveled to England and melted the heart of the Earl and did good to the tenants and were loved by everyone. I thought you were very good, Maya said. It can't be easy to call your mother dearest. No, it isn't, especially when she's Nancy Goodley, who'd pinch you as soon as she would look at you. And your voice didn't wobble in the least. Clovis looked worried again. It had better not. Beastly Lord Fauntleroy is supposed to be seven years old. He told Maya that they were staying for two weeks in Bellum, the first port in the Amazon, and then going on to Manus. It's really a good theater there. Usually we wouldn't get a booking in a big place like that, but the ballet company that was going to come had to cancel. We're putting on a matinee of Fauntleroy every day. If it goes well, we might be able to clear our debts, but if not, of course it'll go well. And I'm so glad you're going to play in Manus because I'll be able to come and see you. It seemed to her really sad that a boy should have to worry about getting spots and that he shouldn't be at all excited about traveling to the Amazon. They were sailing into warm waters now. The sun shone every day. And the sea was a brilliant blue, but Clovis hated the heat. When he wasn't following Maya about and asking her about Yorkshire pudding and apple crumble, he lay under a fin and swatted flies and sighed. I must get back to England, he said, and made her tell him about tobogganing and skating on frozen ponds and muffins afterwards for tea. My foster mother made the best muffins in the world, he would say. For Maya, it was quite different. When she was small, her parents had taken her along when they went up to dig ancient ruins in Greece and Egypt, and she remembered the happiness of being warm even at night and the freedom of the camp. And the closer she got to her destination, the more certain she became that she, what she had felt on the ladder in the library was true and that this new country was for her. I'm going to stay with the twins, she told Clovis. Twins are special, don't you think? Like Romulus and Remus. So they were brought up by wolves, of course. If they're nice, so it'll be all right, said Clovis. But if they're nasty, you'll have a double dose. They won't be nasty, said Maya. When they had been at sea for nearly four weeks, they came on deck one morning to smell not only tar and engine oil and the salt in the wind, but a warm, rich, moldering smell. The smell of not just land, but of the jungle. And within a few hours, they saw a dark line of trees fringed by surf and then they steamed into the mouth of the river and put down anchor at Bellum. 
It was here that the pilgrim players left the ship. They disembarked with as many shouts and arm wavings as when they came on board. Maya and Clovis hugged each other. She really was sorry to see him go. She gave him her address at the Carter so that he could come and see her as soon as he arrived in Manus. The name of the house is Taparini. That means a place of rest, Miss Minton says. So I'm sure it's going to be beautiful, she said. The twins will be really excited to see a proper actor. And you'll come and see me in the play. I promise, said Maya. I absolutely promise. Clovis didn't just hug Maya. He hugged Miss Minton, too. It struck Maya that though he was afraid of so many things, he did not seem to be afraid of her fierce-looking governess. The journey down the Amazon was one that Maya never forgot. In places, the river was so wide that they sailed between distant lines of trees, and Maya understood why it was called the River Sea. But sometimes they made their way between islands, and then on the sandbanks they saw some of the creatures that Maya had read about. Once, a litter of capybaras, like outsized guinea pigs, lumbered after their mother, and they were close enough for the passengers to see their funny snouts and sandy fur. Once they passed a tree whose roots had been killed by the rise of the water, and its bare branches were full of scarlet and blue parakeets, which flew up screeching when the boat came past. And once, Maya saw a gray log lying in the shallows, which suddenly came to life. Oh, look, she said, a crop, I mean an alligator, my first one. And a man sitting close by nodded and said that he was glad that she knew there were no crocodiles in this part of the world. He'd be surprised how many people never learn. They passed plantations of rubber trees and native villages with houses built on stilts to stop them from being flooded when the river rose. The native children came out onto the landing and waved and called out, and Maya waved back and didn't stop until they were out of sight. Sometimes the boat went close enough to the shore for them to pass by old houses owned by the sugar planters or coffee exporters. They could see the verandas with families taking tea and dogs stretched out in the shade and hanging baskets of scarlet flowers. Will it be like that, Maya kept asking. They're sure to have a veranda, aren't they? Perhaps we can do lessons looking out over the river. She was becoming more and more excited. The color, the friendly wa waving native people, the flashing birds all delighted her and she was not troubled by the heat. But at the center of all her thoughts were the twins. She saw them in white dresses with colored sashes like pictures in a book, laughing and welcoming and friendly. She imagined them getting ready for bed, brushing each other's hair, and lying in a hammock with a basket full of kittens on their laps, or picking flowers for the house. They'll have a big garden going down to the river, don't you think? She asked Miss Minton, and a boat with a striped awning, probably. I don't really like fishing because of the hooks, but if they showed me, I suppose you can live off the land in a place like that. Since the letter the twins had written to her was only two sentences long, Maya was free to make up their lives, and she did this endlessly. Wondered if they've tamed a lot of animals. Should think maybe they would have, wouldn't you? Raccoons get very tame. Or maybe they have a pet monkey, a little ca ca a capuchin monkey that sits on their shoulder, and a parakeet, she asked Miss Minchin, who told her to wait and see and set her another exercise in Portuguese grammar. But whatever Miss Minton said made no difference. In Maya's head, the twins paddled their boats between giant water lilies, trekked fearlessly through the jungle, and at night played piano duet, sending the music out into the velvet darkness. They'll know the names of everything, too, won't they? Those orange lilies, no one seems to know what they're called, said Maya. The names will be in a book, said Miss Minchin quellingly, but she might have spared her breath as Maya wandered further and further into the lives of Gwendolyn and Beatrice. They'll shorten their own names, don't you think? Gwen, perhaps, and, and Beatty? It occurred to Maya that Miss Mitten knew quite a lot about the creatures that came, they came across on the river, and when her governess pointed out freshwater dolphins swimming ahead of them, she plucked up the courage to ask what had made her decide to come to the Amazon. Miss Mitten stared out over the rails. At first she did not answer, and Maya blushed, feeling that she had been impertinent. Then she said, I knew someone once who came to live out here. He wrote to me once in a while, and it made me want to see for myself. Oh. Maya was pleased. Perhaps Miss Minton had a friend here and would not be so lonely. Is he still here, your friend? A pause this time was longer. No, Miss Minton said. He died. After a week of sailing down the river, they stopped at Santorum, a port where a big market had been set up. 
the passengers were allowed to, to ashore, and Maya heard the familiar snap and saw that Miss Minton had opened her large black handbag. Mr. Murray gave me some money for you to spend on the journey. Is there anything that you wish to buy? Maya's eyes shone. Presents for the twins, and perhaps for Mr. and Mrs. Carter. I should have done it in England, but it was all such a rush. Have I got enough? Yes, Miss Minton said dryly, handing over a packet of notes. She would have been glad to earn in three months what Mr. Murray had given Maya. The market was dazzling. There were watermelons bigger than babies, and green bananas, and yellow one, and some that were almost orange. There were piles of nuts heaped on barrows, uh, pineapples and peppers and freshly caught fish and fish that had been dried. There were animals tugging at their ropes and delicate lace work and silverware and woven baskets and leather bags. And selling them and talking and laughing were beautiful black women in brilliant colored bandanas and natives in European clothes and natives with painted chests and feathers and slender Brazilian girls with golden skins. But buying presents for the twins was far from easy because Maya was sure that what they would really like were some fluffy baby chicks or a duckling or even a white mouse. Things that are alive are always the best presents, she said, but, some, but Miss Minton was firm. You can't buy them animals till you know what pets they have already. You don't want to get your present eaten on the first day. Here's a picture of Maya and Miss Minton at the market. So Maya bought two lace collars for the twins, an embroidered shell for Miss Carter, and for Mr. Carter, a leather wallet with a picture of a jaguar on it. Then she disappeared, and Miss Minton was just getting anxious when she came back carrying a blue fringed parasol with a carved handle. Because you ruined your umbrella on Henry Hartington, she said, and this will be better for the sun. Miss Minton took the sunshade. It was impossible to guess her face if she was pleased or not. And you, Maya, what did you get for yourself? But the only thing Maya wanted was a mongrel puppy scratching its fleas in a wicker basket. And once again, Miss Minton was firm. They'll probably have a dog already to guard the house, she said. Several, I dare say. And Maya had to be content with that. They still had a few days to travel down the brown, leaf-stained river. Then a few hours before they were due to dock at Manus, the passengers were called on deck by a loudspeaker and shown a famous sight. They'd come to the wedding of the waters, where the brown waters of the Amazon joined the black waters of the River Negro, and they could see the two rivers flowing and distinct, side by side. Then, as they steamed up the Negro, Maya saw the green and gold dome of the theater, she saw the church spires, and the yellow building of the Customs House. They had reached Manus. They had arrived. That's where we're going to stop for today, and we'll pick up tomorrow with Chapter 3. We've been reading Journey to the River Sea by Eva Abotson, published by Puffin Books. I hope that you enjoyed it. Once again, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. I'll see you tomorrow with more.